All right, so I want to do a quick video going over kind of an introduction to our second chapter, which can be the arithmetic logic unit and higher level combinational logic. More on that later. But before we do that, I kind of want to take a step back on more of a theoretical level and talk about how computers process data because it's very different between how we as people and humans process data versus how it happens in an actual digital setting. So I'm just gonna hop on over, and just take a look. So the first part of that is going over differences of number systems. Now, where we are in the current roadmap for the NAND Tetris system is, well, we got past NAND, that's the very building block, and we built some gates, so like ands, ors, not stuff like that. Add some layers of abstraction, like the logic for muxes, 16-bit uh, uh, values, multi-way gates, stuff like that. And then we implement them. So all the elementary gates, and then the more complex gates. And that's kind of where we stopped. We built our chips, and that's pretty much it. Now, we're going to be here for a little bit and culminate in the ALU for Chapter 2. So what the ALU is, is the highest most level of combinational logic. And by combinational logic, I mean, let's take an AND gate, for example. So this AND. Pass a one and zero in it, we get a zero as an output. We have some combination of inputs and output. We do some processing and logic inside of here, and that's it. It's static in place, it never changes. Uh, unless we change the input specifically. Once we get to chapter 3 later on, we'll introduce a concept of time, and that moves on to sequential logic. But again, more on that later. For now, we just need to figure out these. And more specifically, whenever we start getting the 16-bit values, how do we handle them? How does the computer process them? And how can we expand upon our current functionality? So, to do that, we create one of these. An ALU. So it is, as you can see in the diagram, the heart of our computer's CPU, which is a central processing unit. It needs an arithmetic logic unit. And then a collection of registers, which is more chapter three stuff. More on that later. This is currently just to be focusing on what do we do? We can do a lot of stuff with an ALU, but we haven't touched on it yet. So the main part of it is processing a lot of binary data. Now, everything else that you see here is also binary data and memory, the registers, stuff like that. But the purpose of that is storing data. It doesn't do anything else. All the data eventually gets passed through memory, maybe some registers to output from input, so on and so forth. But at some point, it culminates here in connection to the ALU, and then it gets passed out. It's wherever it needs to go. So that's the registers, it goes there. If it goes back to memory, it goes there. But at some point, all these ones and zeros are gonna get passed to the ALU and processed in some form or fashion. Like so. So we have the binary representation of the value 40,521, binary representation of 17, and we are going to essentially add those two values together. So we can take a look at this and see 40,521 and 17, add those together, and we end up with 40,538. Well, that's not too hard. That's pretty simple. I mean, if we just do 3,521, 17, uh, 7 plus 1 is 8, 2 plus 1 is 3, uh, we just drop the 5, the 0, and the 4, and yeah, that's, that's pretty simple. Now, if we don't have the higher level aspect of looking at this in decimal values, then you'd have to know how to do addition and binary. And while addition and decimal is something most people have done for years and years and years, we're really not taught how to do addition in a very good way, because the moment you try to translate it to a different number system, you start thinking that there's a lot more differences than there actually are. And that's due to convenience factors that are in the decimal number system that we're used to. So I'll touch on that in a bit. But for now, we need to focus on what the ALU is going to eventually do. 
So basically, its main function is to compute a given function on two given in-bit values and output a same in-bit value. So n in this case for us is going to be 16 because we're doing the 16-bit computer. So the MOU functions currently that we can do at the end of this chapter will be addition specifically. And then eventually we'll make some stuff like subtraction and maybe addition to a constant, subtraction with a constant. And we got some illogical operations like and and or, not, stuff like that. So at the end of the day, it has a good bit of complexity, but while we could continue to extend its complexity and the number of operations and stuff that it can do, we're gonna dial it back to some very basic operations just to keep things simplistic. You can make an ALU as complex as you want to, nor as minimalistic as you want to. It just depends on what you're doing. We're gonna do a mix of the two somewhere in the center, just because some of the more advanced complexity will be saved for assembly later on in the course. Now, back to what I was going to talk about with the differences in addition and number systems. So we have two here. Well, we have two different number systems. One has a two, one has a 10. That is our base. So we have base two, base 10. Base two is better known as binary. You have ones and zeros. Uh, let's just do something like this. So it's some value. 10 is base 10, which is decimal. It's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So 10 different digits that we have to work with as opposed to this one, which just has a simple two. Now there are more than this. You have stuff like base 16, base eight, this is hexadecimal, this is octal, and they all work in their own different facets and have different digits. So octal is just zero through seven, hexadecimal is zero through F, where you have the exact same thing as decimal, but you have six more digits of A, B, C, D, E, and F to work with. Now, the kind of, I guess, downfall of the decimal system is, let's take a example. Let's do 47 plus five. Well, if you look at this, the way people have learned this over the course of time has been, we have five plus seven, which is two, we carry the one from the 10, and we have four plus one, and it's five. And this is correct, 52, that is the correct value, carry in the one, that's always the correct value, but the real deficit of the decimal system, or the way, at least the way that people are taught it, is this one comes from the fact that we have 10. So nine plus one is a good example, nine plus one is zero, carry the one for that, and we have 10. This one is not so much the one from the 10 as it is one from an overflow bit. So any time you exceed the maximum value in your number system, you will have a carry bit. So let's go back to that example, 47 plus five. Two, if we count it, we have seven here. We count out one, two, and if we go past, we would overflow. So we wrap around back to zero and know that we have a bit to carry over since we overflowed past our maximum value. That'd be three, four, and then five. So we end at two, that's the value we get. And then we make sure to have that carry bit and reminder. So four plus one, 52. So let's take a look at say, uh, 44 plus, I don't know, let's do six. But let's do this in octal, so base eight. So what we have to values with to work with are zero through seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight total values to work with. So if we take a look at it, we see that we have four plus six. So if we do this, we have four, that's one, two, three. If I go past, I have an overflow, so it was our carry bit four, five, six. So this would be ending in two, carry this, and then we have four plus one, which that's still five. And uh, this wasn't 
plan, but I also end with 52. So, uh, that's, that's cool. <laughs> but essentially, it's just the way that these different number systems work. The same thing would happen if I did something like AE plus 36. This might look very complicated at first if you're not familiar with hexadecimal, which we can just take a look at the different digits, which we have A, 9, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Oop, that looks terrible. There we go, that's a bit better. So let's do one, carry a bit, I'm just gonna mark it up here. Two, three, four, five, six, ending in four. And then we have A plus three. So let's remove all this. A plus three, that's one, two, three, carry bit of one up to E. So we end up with E4. So overall, it's not too bad. Now, again, it's convoluted and might be difficult if you are not familiar and you are kind of encumbered by the decimal system and you don't understand the fact that you're going to have a overflow bit value of 1 no matter what because it's not carrying the 1 from 10, it's carrying a 1 as an overflow value. And the exact same thing happens in decimal. So if we were to do something a little more complicated, say 101101 plus 011100, add these two together, we have 1 plus 0 is going to be 1, 0 plus 0 is 0, now 1 plus 1, we're here, add 1, overflows, goes back to 0 with a carry, so 1 plus 1 is 0, carry of 1, and then we have 111, that is going to again be 1 overflows, 0, carry bit 1. So 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 1 with an overflow bit of 1. So it gets kind of comical with decimal with how many 1s and zeros you're going to say. 1 plus 0 plus 1 is going to be a single value overflow, 0, carry, 1 plus 1, 0, carry, 1. There's nothing to add to it. So we have that 1 right there. Now, overall, it's not too bad. Is it convoluted? Yeah, that's just kind of math in general though. But addition is going to work the exact same way no matter the number system if you treat the one as opposed to being a one from carrying a 10 as a just an overflow bit because you exceeded the maximum value in your number system. So in binary, maximum value is one. In decimal, it's nine. In octal, it's seven. In hexadecimal, it's F and ternary it would be 2 and then quaternary would be something like 3. So there's lots of different number systems but addition in it is always going to be consistent and work the same way. So that's usually a spiel I like to go on just because I have some past exposure to people who are more confused on how to do math and different number systems because I think it works and operates on a different principle but really it's just kind of being encumbered by a decimal system do the way we're taught and there's nothing really wrong with that but it's just kind of nice to understand now if we take a look at how a computer works they have some maximum threshold for values that they can handle and if we look at say a 4-bit computer Something very minimal. The maximum value they can handle is 2 to the 4 in an unsigned value. More on signed and unsigned values in the next video. But this would be 2 to the 4, which is going to be 16. If we overflow past 16, we'll run into an error because the computer cannot handle that. So, what do we do? Well, you can use what's known as positional numeral system which is kind of converting the value to a string based on its position, or the position of the digits. So in this case, we have 7053, which has position 0, 1, 2, and 3, starting at the least significant bit to the most significant bit. Least significant because if you change this 3, it has the least impact on this value. It'd be 7053 to 7054 or 2, there's not a big difference here. Whereas with a 7, if we change that, it's now 8,053, 6,053, so it's a change in a thousand 
values. So again, most significant bit is the most impactful one on the change. Least significant bit is the least one. So if you're curious on why we go zero, one, two, three from right to left, that is why. Now, I digress. We have this kind of breakdown down here. There's a summation of zero to n minus one, di times 10 to the i. So let's look more at the addition part here. This, 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 and this. You can kind of view it if it had like parentheses, kind of break it down. Might be a little bit easier way to view it. But each one of these multiplications indicates a position in our overall positional numeral system. So three times 10 to the zero is going to be three times one. So three is going to be in our ones place here. Or the zero, the least significant bit. Whereas five times 10 to the one is 50. So we add 50 to it, so I have 53. And we have zero times 10 to the two, so that's gonna be zero. So it goes here in the second position. And then we have 10 times, oh, seven times 10 to the three, which is 7,000. So we add that. And then we have 7053. So no matter how large of a number, if we convert that to positional numeral system, we can exceed the maximum value of our computer. It won't be able to do direct operations. You'll be breaking it down to a convoluted way of doing it with strings on the individual positions, but it gets around a good bit of our kind of more quirky doing really complicated large math on systems that can't handle it. So if you were to exceed, say, a 64-bit value on a 64-bit computer, you see at this value, which that would be a very large value, you can do it in positional numeral system as a means to get around that. But the main point to this is to show how we can do decimal to binary pretty easily using positional numeral systems. So if we have this binary value of 11011100011101 and we treat it like positional numeral system in reverse, then you can see that we have, instead of now 10 to a power of the position, we have two because we're in base two as opposed to base 10 and we're always gonna have one times something or zero times something. So in this case, we would have one times two to the 12 plus one times two to the 11 plus zero times two to the 10, and then so on and so forth, repeating this pattern, you can see it happening down here. And you can actually shorthand this to two to the 12 plus two to the 11 plus two to the nine, because there's a one in the nines place to the eight plus two to the seven plus two to the three, because we can skip these, or zeros, plus two to the two, plus two to the zero. Add all that together, we end up with 7,053. So we started with 1101100011101 oh, one, one, zero, one, 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 zero, 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 one, one, zero, one. And we did some position number system and reverse and ended up with 7053, converting this binary value, or, yeah, because it's binary value to this decimal value. Now, we can also do it in the other way around, but it is going to be a little bit different. So doing binary decimal is going to be the same thing as what we just did. So we have 110101. That's 0 through 5. So we have a 2 to the 5, 2 to the 4, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 0 add all this together, and we end up with a value of 53. Doing it the other way around, though, is going to be a little bit different. Now, we end up with this same structure here, but how we achieve that is a little bit different. So you see that you start with 53. Well, we also have this chart over here of powers of 2, and what we want to do is find the first value that doesn't go over this. It's the highest value that doesn't overflow 53. So it would be between these two. So 64 overflows it, so we can't use it. So you're still with 32. So we have 2 to the 5. Now 2 to the 5 is 32. So 53 minus 32. 
Uh, it's one, five, three is 21. So we're going to 21 now. So what is the first value that doesn't overflow 21? Two to the four, it's going to be 16. So I'm going to do 21 minus 16, which is five. Then we want to do first value that doesn't overflow five, which is going to be four, two to the two. So five minus four, that's one. And the value that is one, it can be equal to, which is two to the zero. So now we have one minus one, zero. So we end up with uh, zero, which is where we stop. So we end up with this two to the five plus two to the four plus two to the two plus two to the zero. So we do the actual position number system and we end up with a binary value of a one in the zero's place, zero in the one's place, a one in the two's place, so in three's place, and then a one, then a four, and five, like so. So we end up with one, one, zero, one, zero, one. So that's not too bad. So let's do it one more time. Okay. So let's see, we have one, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero. Let's make this a zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six. So we want two to the six, plus two to the four, plus two to the three, plus two to the one, and some value. Now, the way I got these numbers, is I just look where I have a one in these places. So I have a six, a four, a three, and a one, and that should be my overall equation. Add all those results together, and I should end up with my decimal value. The answer's on the next page. I don't feel like doing the actual math in my head, so bear with me for a moment. Now, other way around, decimal to binary, we have 523, and we need the first value that doesn't overflow that. So that is 2 to the 9 with 512. So 2 to the 9, we do 523 minus 512. So 1, 1, 0, so we end up with 11. First value that doesn't overflow 11 is 8. So you have 2 to 3. So it's got a very large gap there. So 11 minus 8 is 3. And the first value that doesn't overflow 3 is 2. So we have 2 to the 1. And 3 minus 2 is 1, which now is 2 to the 0. And that is going to be 1 minus 1, giving us 0, and then we're done. So we should have a one in the nines place, a one in the threes place, a one in the ones place, and a one in the zeros place. So real quick, let's see. So we had two to the six, so six, four, three, one, nine, three, one, two. Oh, nine, three, one, zero. Six, four, three, or six, four, three, one, nine, three, one, zero. And that is exactly what it was. So if we add all these together, we get 90. And if we apply these in the appropriate places, we end up with one zero 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 one zero one one. So overall, I'll do a check real quick. Yep, okay, just want to make sure. So overall, that's not too bad. And that kind of just details the differences between number systems, how to deal with them and convert between our traditional decimal to the more machine-like binary. That's not the only way to do those conversions. If you've learned it a different way, that's perfectly fine. You can use it, do whatever it does, makes the most sense to you. And obviously there are online calculators. This is just the way that it happens, like an explanation of what is happening if you pass them through a calculator. And it's not always gonna be exactly this, because again, like I said, there are more than one way to do this, but this is just the way that the Nan Tetris guys like to do it. So that's what I'm gonna convey. There's going to be more theory before we get to the actual ALU and implementation of it. So we'll go over that in the next video. So that's it for this one. I hope you learned something. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.